This former Russian prisoner Vladimir Karamurza is sharing his story after being released in the largest prisoner swap between the U.S. and Russia since the Cold War. Karamurza, one of President Vladimir Putin's harshest critics, was sentenced to 25 years in prison on treason charges after speaking out against Russia's war in Ukraine. He spent two and a half years locked up in different Russian prison colonies, 11 months of that time in solitary confinement. And on August 1st, Kara Mirza was freed along with Americans Evan Gershkovich, Paul Whelan, and Alsu Kermasheva, all sentenced on espionage charges and for allegedly spreading false information. And Vladimir Kara Mirza joins me now for his first interview with ABC News since his release. Vladimir, thank you for coming on to share your story. I'm sure some parts of this are still difficult to talk about. Good morning, Diane, and thank you for having me on your program. Well, frankly, the past three weeks, um, have felt as if I'm watching some kind of a film. You know, it's a very good one, but it still feels very unreal because, you know, just a few weeks ago, I was so confident that I would uh, end my life in uh, in Putin's Siberian prison, and now I'm at home with my family. So it's uh, it's, it's something out of the books, and uh, actually, you know, I'm, I am a historian by education, and one of my areas of study has been the history of the Soviet dissident movement, and there's this sort of belief that every every historian subconsciously wants to personally experience the area of his or her study, and it's uh, it's just quite you know, well amusing, really, that we were kicked out of the country in the same way that Soviet dissidents were back in the 70s and 80s. And uh, I have to say that uh, you know when I had uh, my meeting with the president a few days ago to personally thank him for the role he has played in that historic exchange, uh, you mentioned the uh, three Americans who were released as part of the uh, as part of that exchange earlier this month. Sixteen people uh, in total were saved, snatched from the hell of, of Putin's gulag during this uh, during this exchange during this event, and only four American presidents in history. Uh, two Republicans, Ford and Reagan, and two Democrats, Carter and now Biden, have negotiated such prisoner releases, prisoner exchanges, to help save prisoners of conscience from the Soviet or Russian gulag. Uh, and I think it is important to note that, you know, in, in this day and age when there is a sort of cynical stereotype that all politics is about expediency and realpolitik and that there's no room for principle or value anymore, uh, I think it is important to sort of pause and note uh, that sometimes the leaders of Western democracy don't just pay lip service to uh, protecting human rights, but actually do it in practice too. And I think it's, it's a very important fact to remember. So, Vladimir, what has life been like for you since being released and being reunited with your family in this way you say you never expected? Uh, well, it's uh, it's still a transition. I mean, it's only in Hollywood movies that somebody can just, you know, walk out of the prison, clean oneself up and move on. I mean, in, in real life, it takes sort of time to, to adjust back into reality. I was in, uh, in Putin's prison for two and a half years, and as you mentioned, almost 11 months uh, of those straight in solitary confinement. And it's... Uh, it's it's very difficult psychologically when you know when you're not able to share a word with another human being. I mean, actually, by international law, by by United Nations minimum standard rules on the treatment of prisoners, solitary confinement longer than 15 days is officially considered to be a form of uh, torture, degrading and inhumane treatment. Because you know, Aristotle said that human beings are social animals. We need human interaction just as much as we need oxygen to breathe, or food to eat, or, or water to drink, and it's. When you're completely deprived of it, uh, it isn't easy. And, uh, you know, I was also forbidden from calling my wife and children. I was forbidden from going to church. Uh, and this, this is how the Putin regime treats its opponents in prison. It doesn't just put people in prison for opposing uh, this, uh, this government, its policies, its aggressive war against Ukraine, which is, was, was the reason I was arrested. But it also, in prisons, keeps uh, its political opponents in the harshest and strictest possible conditions. Alexei Navalny was in exactly the same situation. And so uh, it is a process to, to adjusting back to reality. And as I said, it seems uh, the past few weeks seem like uh, so I'm, I'm watching some kind of a movie. But it's, uh, it's a very good one. And I hope that there's not too much time passes before sort of reality fully settles back in. Uh, we are wishing you the same, of course, and I, I don't want to harp on this too much because, again, I'm sure it's hard to talk about, but you say during that time in solitary confinement that even something as simple as a pen and a paper, you only got that for 90 minutes a day to either work on your case or write to family members. So, so not only were you secluded from talking to people, you were even secluded from just writing things down. What was that like? Well, frankly, every day uh, in prison is like uh, a groundhog day. Uh, you know, it's... 
endless, meaningless, and, and exactly the same. You wake up at five o'clock in the morning, for the wake up call, you attach your bum to the wall, uh, and then essentially you just sit in your small cell. Uh, mine was two by three meters, so that's about seven by 10 feet. Uh, and you literally just do nothing. Uh, you have nobody to speak to, you have nothing to do, you have nowhere to go. Uh, you get out uh, for 90 minutes for a small so-called walk, which is essentially just walking around in a circle in a small roof-covered prison courtyard, which isn't that much bigger than a cell. Uh, and for another 90 minutes, you are given a uh, pen and paper to to do everything you need to do during that day. So if, if I had to prepare for court hearings, uh, to read uh, letters from family and friends, to respond to those letters, to uh, to make any notes, you know, to, to respond to questions from journalists and writing and so on. All of that you have to stuff into 90 minutes a day and for the rest of the day again. You just sit and do nothing. And, um, and you know, when it happens day after day, week after week, month after month, uh, it starts getting, it starts getting to you, frankly. And I think what is really important to remember, uh, and this is the reason I, you know, I, I keep sort of coming back to this, uh, while 16 of us were snatched from the hell of Putin's Gulag because of that East-West prisoner of change earlier this month, there are thousands who still remain back there, hundreds of Russian political prisoners, a lot of them, uh, those who have been opposed, those who have been arrested, those Russians who have been arrested for publicly opposing Putin's dictatorship and his aggressive war against Ukraine, but also thousands of Ukrainian prisoners of war, Ukrainian civilian hostages. There are hundreds and hundreds of political prisoners in neighboring Belarus, because let's not forget there are two dictatorships still left in Europe, Putin's Russia and Lukashenko's Belarus. And it is important that we remember about them every single day. And uh, as I discussed at my meeting with the President of the United States a few days ago, we must do everything that we can to make sure that they are also free and that they are also reunited with their families. Uh, and I am not going to rest and I'm not going to relent until the day uh, that that finally happens. And Vladimir, that is probably what you need, a lot of rest and recuperation after what you've been through to try to regroup with your family. And yet, here you are. You say in the days leading up to the prisoner exchange, the guards tried to force you to say that Putin was a legitimate president, try to get you to put it in writing, that you refused. You gave an interview years ago before you were arrested. And now here you are again, speaking out against this regime. Do you fear for your safety now and do you fear for others who speak out against Putin right now? How do you see this result? Well, look, safety is not the word we're used to in the, in the Russian democratic opposition. We know what this regime does. Vladimir Putin has been in power for 25 years, a quarter of a century. This month actually marks exactly 25 years since he was appointed prime minister by uh, then President Boris Yeltsin. And this December will mark 25 years of Putin in the Kremlin nonstop. So there's an entire generation of people in, in my country, in Russia, that have grown up not knowing any other political reality. And, uh, you know, we know what it entails to be in opposition to Vladimir Putin's regime. Uh, my closest friend and my mentor, Boris Nemtsov, the leader of the Russian Democratic Opposition, was murdered, gunned down uh, on Putin's orders almost a decade ago in February of 2015 on a bridge right outside the Kremlin. Uh, Alexei Navalny, another very prominent opposition leader, as you know well, uh, was uh, killed in prison earlier this year. I myself was poisoned twice uh, by uh, Putin's security agents, FSB agents, and then put into prison for a 25-year sentence, which is no doubt where I, where, where I would have ended my life had it not been for this international prisoner exchange facilitated by the American and the German government. So we know uh, what it uh, entails and, and what, uh, what risks it carries to be in opposition to Vladimir Putin's aggressive and murderous dictatorship. But you know what? I, I care about my country. I love my country. And I think Russia deserves a much better future than to be in the hands uh, of an authoritarian, aggressive, murderous, illegitimate dictatorship. And so whatever risks are involved, uh, you know, whatever else it entails, I'm not going to rest. I'm not, not going to stop until the day when Russia does become a democracy. And I have absolutely no doubt that that day will come. Again, I'm a historian. And even though the arc of history may not bend as fast as we like. There's no doubt that in the end, it does bend towards liberty. You know, just 35 years ago, which is nothing by historical standards, if you looked at the map of Europe, uh, you know, let's say the annual Freedom House map uh, that is published by um, this very prominent US-based human rights organization, uh, you, you would have seen 35 years ago 
that uh, half of Europe, for example, were uh, colored in purple, which is the way they mark unfree dictatorial countries. Today, there are only two dictatorships left on the map of Europe. Those are Putin's Russia and Lukashenko's Belarus. And I have absolutely no doubt that the day will come uh, when uh, our country becomes a democracy too. And that's frankly going to be a very good day, not just for Russia, but for the entire world. Because the way uh, you know these dictatorial regimes operate in Russia, they always represent a threat not only to our own people domestically in terms of the massive repression they engage in, but also they represent a threat to world order and to international security because they always end up engaging in outward aggression, as we see very clearly from the regime of Vladimir Putin. And, and Vladimir... so when Russia finally has a democratic government that leaves at peace with its own people and with the outside world, that's going to be a very good day for everybody. And I think it is incumbent on us to work actively to try to bring this day a little bit closer. And I know that's what you have done and are continuing to do. Uh, we wish you the best. I'm glad to see you home. And I hope you are taking at least a little time to rest and regroup with your family. Vladimir Karmursa, great to talk to you. Thank you for coming on.